So let's take the thought for a few minutes, not too long, of holiness and love and how that affects us. So take your sermon notes. We'll go for a few minutes. I won't keep you too long on overtime. I'm going to give you three statements to start with. Agree, disagree. True, false. All right? Here's number one. Trouble comes from liars. Okay? Anybody disagree with that one? Okay? I think we can mostly agree that that's a true statement. Number two, true or false, love should come from Christians, not lies. Christians should be lovers, not liars. True. Number three, truth should come from Christians, not trouble. So all of this is pointing to what do we do when someone around us who's a Christian is lying or creating trouble? What should we do? What should Christians do when the holiness of God is being violated, when the truth of God is being compromised? So when you see trouble circling around you, when you see a Christian that you believe is lying or doing something they should not do, what should you do? I'm going to suggest to you quickly this morning six ways to investigate, six ways to test whether a Christian is lying or not. So here's test number one. Here's what you need to do. Get ready. Go to the trouble. This is very difficult for most of us. Friends, hear me. Trouble, lying, should be somehow acted upon. You cannot keep ignoring a liar. You're going to have to understand if a Christian is slandering, gossiping, you're going to have to avoid procrastination. You're going to have to realize that you got to move toward that individual. So, Roger, where do you get this at? Well, 2 Corinthians 12.20 says this. Look on the screen. We saw this last week. For I am afraid, Paul said to the Corinthian church, that perhaps when I come to you, I may find you to be not what I wish and may be found by you to be not what you wish. We both are not liking this. That perhaps, maybe, there will be strife, jealousy, anger, angry tempers, disputes, slanders, gossip, arrogance, and disturbances. Now, we showed you last week that Jesus said all of these things are wrong. Christians should not be participating in this. And the Ten Commandments reminds all Christians, don't be doing these things. So, friends, listen, I'm going to give you an, a metaphor. I'm going to give you something to think about. When you see someone lying, denying the truth, manipulating, cheating, I'm going to suggest to you, you start thinking of a smelly toilet. So when truth is suppressed, when truth is denied, when truth is exchanged for a lie, start thinking an outhouse. I mean, friends, it stinks. It smells. Start thinking a sewer. Start thinking the gutter, a cesspool. See, friends, God gave us the Ten Commandments to remind us how to smell good how to stay away from the stink and the garbage of life. Keep us away from the toilet bowl of evil. So now we go to chapter 13. Watch this. Paul says to the Corinthian church, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Every fact is to be confirmed by the testimony of two or three witnesses. So friends, Paul is pushing the idea here. He writes this letter, I'm going to come to you. And he says, there's going to be an investigation. So friends, why does Paul do this? Why does he go? Hardest thing in the world for Christians to do is to go. Well, watch this. Remember last week, that word at the end of verse 19, 2 Corinthians 12, 19. Look up there on the screen. Last word, beloved. Christians go to Christians out of love. We go to help each other, not hurt each other not condemn each other. I'm gently suggesting to you, if you avoid a liar, if you avoid going to the trouble, you are allowing poison to grow in that relationship. A lot of us want to stick our head in the sand. We want to deny that some trouble is brewing, and we just simply want to walk away from it and let somebody else deal with it, and then it just simply blows up on us. 
Be real careful not to do that. Can I suggest to you number two? Give the liar three I love you visits. Three. Well, okay, watch this. Here's 2 Corinthians 3, 1. Paul, Paul says, this is the third time I'm coming to you. So friends, listen, pour on the love. Now, you're saying, Roger, he's not saying three love visits. No, but he did come and visit them three times. But I'm going to give you more evidence to offer three love visits. Look up here on the screen. Jesus said this, Matthew 18, 15. Visit number one. If your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. That's visit number one. That's the first love visit. Visit number two. But if he does not listen to you, take, go a second time, one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three, every witness, every fact may be confirmed. Visit number three. Jesus said, if he refuses to listen Visit number one, visit number two, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, so there's another visit going on, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Friends, listen, there's something about going face to face and talking it out. Help, help me understand why we don't want to do that. One love visit is good but three is more powerful. Remember Jesus' words, Matthew 18? Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times, Peter says. No, no. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So friends, forgiveness includes speaking the truth and love. If you're going to call one another beloved, if you want to call one another Christians, then we need to engage each other. Dialogue. I'm going to give you five tips real quick. Five tips to do on these three visits. All right? Tip number one, keep an open mind. Do not prejudge. Somehow or another, a lot of people are biased. They jump to conclusions. Tip number one, Keep an open mind. Tip number two, be meek and humble. When you go to your brother or sister, don't go aggressively. Be meek and humble. Tip number three, keep a gentle tone on your voice. A gentle tone. It's amazing how much we react when the tone goes up. Be careful. Keep a gentle tone. Tip number three. Tip number four. Here's a great question to always ask. Can you explain what happened? I use this little phrase in all kinds of circumstances. Help me understand. Can you explain what happened? It's a wonderful, neutral statement to ask of each other. I want to hear your point of view. All right, tip number five. Listen and ask questions. And after you've done that for about 10 minutes, ask some more questions and listen. And after you've done that for about 10 minutes, ask some more questions and listen. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gently saying to every one of us, it's amazing how the more patient we are and we ask questions, how much more revelation will come out. All right, test number three. Listen well to eyewitnesses. That's in 13.1. You see it there? The last 13.1, 2 Corinthians 13.1. Look at the last word in the sentence. Witnesses. Friends, a witness is someone who saw the trouble, heard the lie, personally was at the event. They're an eyewitness. You, you cannot go on hearsay. Don't go on secondhand information. Don't go on gossip. Don't go on slander. May I suggest to you, bless you, bless you, Bless you, bless you. I got you blessed, Virgie. Uh, Virgie and I went to Israel together and we blessed her a hundred times because she sneezed off. I'm teasing her. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20. Notice, people, please don't jump to conclusions. You go to the witness because you want to make sure of what happened. Look at the word. 
2 Corinthians 12, 20. For I'm afraid that perhaps when I come, Paul is not pronouncing them guilty. He's going to go and listen first to the witnesses, the eyewitnesses. Test number four. Interview multiple witnesses. This is an amazing wisdom that God gives us. 2 Corinthians 13, 1, notice. It says there, by the testimony of two or three. Where did that wisdom come from? That you have multiple witnesses you should interview. I'll tell you where it came from, Deuteronomy 17, 6. You say, Roger, really? Friends, that's almost 1,500 to 2,000 years prior to the Apostle Paul. Deuteronomy 17, 6, Deuteronomy 19, 15. Deuteronomy 19, 15, Deuteronomy 17, 6. Jesus commanded it in Matthew 18, 20, and it's recorded also in 1 Timothy 5, 19. We need to be aware that we see different things. So understand, multiple witnesses gives us greater clarity, greater knowledge of what's going on. I want you to drop to verse 5. Verse 5, 2 Corinthians 13, 5 is for Roger, and so is verse 6. It happens to be for you as well. Here's what it says. Roger, test yourselves. Congregation, people of God, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Don't be lying. Don't be cheating. Don't be slandering. Examine yourselves to see if you're genuinely following Jesus. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you fail the test? Look at verse 6. But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves, Paul's saying, I'm walking in the truth. Ourselves do not fail the test. Paul followed the truth. This church went off into the gutter, into the sewer, and he's calling them out. I'm suggesting to you test number five. Write this one down. For credible, for credibility, you need to get face-to-face -face testimony. In today's American culture, this is very difficult. Look at verse 1 again, 13.1. See the word testimony confirmed by the testimony that's face-to-face -face 2,000 years ago. Today, we have a hard time spending time with each other. I came across an interesting stat. The teenagers are saying if it wasn't for Snapchat and Instagram, they would not have friends. Let me repeat that. Teenagers are saying if it wasn't for Snapchat and Instagram, they would not have friends. That is an amazing revelation. What happened to face-to-face? -to -face? What happened to love-to-love, heart-to-heart? -to -heart? Married couples are saying, one married couple said this, our marriage struggles because we spend so much time with 3,000 friends on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, the television, uh, the computer, uh, the smartphone can rob you from going face to face with each other. Don't let it rob you. Put it down. Disconnect it. Walk away from it. You got to get love FaceTime in with each other where you can confirm truth. Why? Why is FaceTime so important? Friends, because body language is, means a lot. Hearing a person talk and share what happened could help the understanding of the situation. Can I suggest to you number six? You've got to recall challenges from the past. A lot of times in life, problems a year ago, last month, last week, five years ago, put it all together, it might affect today's trouble. Look at, with me at verse 2, 2 Corinthians 13, 2. I have previously said, when present the second time, though now absent, I say in advance to those who have sinned in the past and to the rest as well, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. Look at verse 3. Since you are seeking for proof of the Christ who speaks in me and who is not weak toward you, but mighty in you. Now, next Sunday, we're going to look at verse 4. Look at it real quick today. For indeed, Jesus was crucified because of weakness. Yet he lives because of the power of God. For we also are weak in him. 
just as Judas betrayed, just as we all mess up, we need a God that has power, for we also are weak in him, yet we will live with him because of the power of God directed towards you. Do not keep on lying. I can't tell you, congregation, how many marriages I see explode because of cheating and lying. Can I just nudge all of you? I can't tell you how many uh, people lose their jobs at work because of cheaters, because of liars. We live in a world where truth seems to be just whatever it is I want it to be. Please, don't go there. It is understandable that we're weak. That's why we need Jesus. Paul's saying to this church that if compromise, compromise, we need to talk about it. I just nudge every one of you. If you see a liar, a Christian who's lying, do not ignore it. Great truth here. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, please. God, I say thank you for Scripture that reminds me to speak the truth in love to nudge people to follow Jesus, not their feelings, not the lie. God, may we be people that understand what that means. With every head bowed, can I pray for anyone here who understands what a toilet smells like, what the sewer is all about, Can I pray for anyone here that's willing to say, Pastor, I need to move closer to the truth in whatever area of your life. If that's true for you, would you just raise a hand? Pastor, pray for me. Just lift up the hand. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. You know what's hurting you. Would you move away from it before it destroys you? destroys your family, your marriage. Just lift up the hand. Just one one more time, if anybody else, someone else, thank you. Just lift the hand up once. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. God, I say thank you for the way you move in my heart just by studying scripture and thinking on these words and presenting them. God, teach me to move closer to the truth and away from anything that's not the truth. God, I ask you to bless each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.